ESPN presents the NASCAR Bush Series. Tonight, 250 laps from the Richmond International Raceway in Virginia's capital city. A huge crowd has come through the turnstiles, as always here, ready to see if their hometown hero, Denny Hamlet, can go to victory lane and send the trophy up to Blacksburg and Virginia Tech. Let's go trackside for the command to get it started. Stands. The fans really love it here at Richmond International Raceway. But Dale Jarrett, I want to ask you as a driver, why do you guys love coming here to race? Because the driver can make a difference here. Depending on how much brake you want to put and how much throttle you want to put down coming off the corner can determine what kind of lap time and how much fun you're going to have as a race driver at this track. It's a blast to race here. You, you were mentioning brakes. You saw Tim Brewer. It, it's awful scary with him with a blowtorch. Brakes are the key tonight. Yeah, Marty, when you come to a short track, anytime you come to a short track, the brakes are probably one of the most important components on the car. And the, here at Richmond, the straightaways are long, the turns are tight, and these guys want to carry a lot of speed all the way down to the corner, so they have to use a lot of brakes to get the car slowed down to make these tight turns. So the cars are pulling out onto the racetrack. The fans are ready. We're ready. We hope you're ready as we'll be back with green flag action here at Richmond International Raceway. NASCAR Bush Series action at Richmond is brought to you by Aaron's with over 1,400 stores nationwide. Everyone is a lucky dog at Aaron's by Best Buy. Best Buy has appliance specialists who can help you select the right appliances. And by Scott's Turf Builder Plus 2. Feeds and strengthens grass, kills weeds completely. All right, as the cars are out onto the track on the uh, pace laps, let's talk about the fact that you'll be able to see our starting grid across the top of the screen. 15 of the top 20 qualifiers are double duty drivers. But one of the guys that we're going to watch in the number seven spot in his first attempt and his first qualifying effort, Bobby Santos III. That's right. He's going to start seventh for the first time. Now let's uh, check in now with our in-race reporter, Marcus Ambrose. Can you speak Australian there, Dale? I'm not sure that I can, but I'm going to try. <laughs> hey, Marcus Ambrose, Dale Jerry, do you have a copy? Yeah, I got your dial. Hey, mate, uh, how tough is it? You practiced in the morning, you qualified in the middle of the afternoon, and now you're racing at night. Uh, what does that do from a driver's perspective? What are you thinking right now about your race car? Uh, it's not too bad for this thing, go. You know, I love racing, and the longer I want the track, the better it is. All right. Um, a lap around here. We know it's a fast racetrack. It's going to be even faster tonight. What is the key, from your perspective, of a good fast lap around here? Well, you know, this is my very first race at Richmond, so I'm going to this thing eyes wide open. I'm just really focused on getting rid of these first 50 laps. I'm sure this second lane is going to come in, and uh, that's where our car was running green practice. We're hoping it's going to be the same tonight. Okay, mate. Have a good night. Good luck. Thanks, uh, Dale. Let's hope for a good night, eh? His crew chief, Greg Connors, from right here in Virginia, Andy. Hey, Greg Connor, Andy Petrie in the booth. You got a copy? Yeah, I got you, Andy. Hey, Greg, how do the team stay focused for the course of like a one-day show when you guys practice so early and don't race until night? I tell you what, it, it's really tough for us. Uh, luckily, the track this morning was a lot cooler than when we qualified, so we're hoping it'll be closer to that time. But uh, we weren't too bad this morning. We were a real terrible job in qualifying, so hopefully that will translate into a better race tonight for the Kingsford Ford Fusion. Okay, Greg, hope you guys have a great race. Thank you. Everybody be safe out there. And we hope for that, too, as we take a look at our onboard cameras, and uh, we'll give you an idea of just all the views that we've got. Mike Wallace actually has two views, including one that has the brake rotors that we're going to be talking a lot about. Sam Hornish, Jr., our pole sitter, Denny Hamlin, Dave Gilliland, Jeff Burton, and David Rudiman, the six onboard drivers. Let's check in the pit lane for the final time. Jamie Little, you're up first. Well, Marty, our current series points leader, Carl Edwards, is gracing the cover of the current issue of men's fitness. They call him NASCAR's fittest man. Well, that could be the key to winning here tonight, because as we know, Carl is both fit and fast. He won here in 2005 and said it was 
one of the most fun and exciting wins of his career. Can he do it again? We'll find out in 250 laps, Mike. Thanks, Jamie. Crew Chief Drew Blickensdurfer describes his driver, Matt Kenseth, as a perfectionist. So it may come as no surprise to know that after his qualifying lap on the outside of the front row, Kenseth described it as a sloppy lap. He's always looking to improve. So he comes into this race with three consecutive third place finishes in the Richmond Bush races. And for a perfectionist, Dave, that's just unacceptable. Mike, Jeff Burton was almost perfection in qualifying. He will start fourth tonight. But the last time the Bush Series cars raced here was last fall. And Jeff Burton was leading the race, cut down a right front tire. When he did that, he hurt the, the cooling system for the brakes on his car. They ultimately finished 40, dropping out of the race. Gucci Pat Smith told me quite simply, tonight, Richmond owes us one. Marty. All right, thanks, Dave. As we get ready, we've got about a, oh, a lap and a half to go. Gives us time to bring in Andy once again and talk about what we should be watching. Well, Marty, what we need to watch for are these red-hot rotors. We'll see them glowing. When these guys go in the corner, we'll get good shots of these brake rotors glowing, and the brake wear is really an issue at a short track like we talked about earlier. Tire management. Uh, NASCAR doesn't give these uh, teams but five sets of tires. They burn one set up in practice. They've only got four sets of tires available for the race, so they've got to manage their tires. In short track, beating and banging. I love racing here under the lights. You get to see a lot of sparks fly, and sometimes you see the tempers flare. And at this time by, it'll be one lap to go at the line. Dale, when you're at this moment in the race, what are your thoughts? I think your thoughts are just getting started. A good, clean start, uh, taking care of your car at the beginning. But you have to be careful. If you're back from 30th on back, you know that those leaders, are got, they have clean air, and they're coming fast. And what you're going to do is you're going to drive this thing hard. This is when you have to really be careful with the brakes when you're back in the pack. It's easy to run down in there and have to get on the brakes harder uh, as things start to jam up. So you really have to be careful at the beginning here. But you're just jacked up and ready to go. Well, it's also different if you're a skilled veteran like some of our double duty drivers. And then I keep thinking about Bobby Santos in third starting seventh in his very first race. Yeah, Bobby Santos, great qualifying run. I'll tell you, we're going to be watching this guy real close. He was uh, in the test up here earlier, testing a couple days. He was fast up here then. So I know these guys are really pumped up. He's in the 91 car. He's on the inside. You'll be able to watch him here. He's in row number four. Lights are out on the pace car. We'll be coming through turns three and four. Put the hammer down. We're going full throttle at Richmond. Be ready. Start the race. Be ready. Be ready. Be ready. Get ready. Sounds like a lot of chaos on the track, but it's all controlled chaos. Denny Hamlin has the lead after lap number one. Matt Kenseth in second. Shane Huffman in third. Jeff Burton and Dave Blaney round out your top five. Yeah, I don't know if uh, that was one of Denny Hamlin's spotters that we heard to be ready, but he was ready. When they threw the green flag, he took off. And yeah, uh, we know he's got a fast race car. He got a great start, jumped out there, and I tell you, I thought that we might even see a black flag because he got such a good start. But I guess it was clean, and uh, maybe that outside line just didn't get going quite as good as the uh, inside line. Yeah, those first, uh, it looked like 10 or 12 cars here have gotten single file, and they could race hard like that, they know. But there's a lot of racing back uh, through the pack, and, and that's where these guys know they have to get on with the program right now. Yeah, right now the biggest pressure is on uh, Shane Huffman. Dave Blaney's right there. You saw the Navy car going through the 88 of Huffman. Blaney right behind him. Oh, and already Kyle Krizilov, who is coming off a career best fifth, is got us into our first caution here in lap number three. Doesn't look like he's uh, banged up the Clabber Girl fusion. All right, but, good uh, job, bud. When, uh, when, the caution, when uh, the pit road opens, we'll come in and take four tires and throw the fuel. Now, I don't know if the flat right was what caused it or whether or not that was the end result. Well, what, I see a tire mark there on the side of the car, so they may have some contact here. That's J.J. Yelly in the one. Yeah, perfect example of early in the race, you, you still don't have a lot of heat uh, in the tires right now. You, the air pressures are still pretty low. You try to get back in the gas, and he, one of two things is going to happen a lot of times. Uh, if your car is on the loose side, you, you're going to chase the back end up into that car. It looked like his car pushed up a little bit. He tried to stay off of J.J. Yelly, and, and in turn, spun himself out. Yeah, and that flat tire came from the flat spot that he put on the tire whenever he locked the brakes up and slid to the apron. Yeah, we see this happen a lot uh, on restarts and, and the beginning of the race. Uh, again, 
again because of the low air pressures. And you get on that bottom, you're trying to really get a run and uh, makes it difficult. And there you see the tire as he is in pit lane getting the repairs taken care of. Stay with us. Here at Richmond International Raceway, lap eight of 250. We're back to green flag racing. You're riding on board with pole sitter and race leader Denny Hamlin. Looking out the back, that is Matt Kenseth and Jeff Burton right behind. Yeah, Matt Kenseth already started trying to work that high groove in down in turns one and two. Jeff Burton got up beside him, but uh, you can really get a good run off the corner, and Matt was able to pull back in front of him. But you can see his car right there, well, he's a little loose. The battle for 12th and 13th. That's uh, Tony Raines in the 33, getting underneath Kyle Busch, and he takes over the spot. Yeah, we'll see this outside groove become better and better all night long. And uh, Matt Kenseth knows that's where he needs to be running. And I'm sure he's just going to kind of clean that groove off, get it ready for him later in the race, because that will develop. I think there's a tire going down, guys. Right rear. That sounded like Kyle Busch. Sounded like Kyle Busch. Yeah, and you see him uh, up on top of the racetrack. And so you'll be a little bit easier going in the corner. If you think that's a possibility, you'll ease it into the corner. That gives you a little bit more room up there to, to work with that. We'll see what happens with Kyle. But he's been passed by a couple of cars so far. Including David Rudiman right now. And that's Scott Wimmer in the 21 coming up next. And originally, that was not supposed to be Wimmer's ride, but things changed. Yeah, Timothy Peters was originally slotted for that ride. And uh, they made a change. They're going to put Scott Wimmer in the car for at least a couple more races here coming up and uh, he's giving it a pretty good ride here and it looks like Kyle Busch is hanging on for dear life yeah that's really a bad feeling when you've got something like that you know you you're not sure if it's a tire or not it could just be that you know you're you're set up you started out extremely loose and and everything's just not coming up to par right now so uh, but you don't want to pit and get those laps down and not have anything wrong so you're in a tough position as a driver yeah it is a difficult uh, position but what I was gonna say the same thing Dale. a lot of these guys are starting these cars out extremely free knowing the track's gonna tighten up we've got a crash that is Sam Hornish jr. Okay. We've got our second caution that happened up in turn number two. So the man who has won here twice in an Indy car and starting next week will be defending his win at the Indianapolis 500 from last year Pretty bad on the right front corner. is into the wall on lap 14 and he's right. He's got a lot of damage to the right front. See Sam's on the outside end of the corner here and Stephen Wallace down on the bottom. Uh, looks like Stephen could have possibly gotten his left front down on the apron, and, and that happens a lot as you're trying to go right around the bottom. And what will happen is it'll turn the car really quickly right there, and then you have to correct it, and he didn't have room to correct with Sam Hornish being right beside him. Yeah, his car got just really loose, and the only, thing, the only choice that Stephen had was to chase the car up the hill, and their 12 car was just there. Yeah. All right, let's ride on board with Sam Hornish Jr., and you'll uh, go for the ride as we go to break. You know, the cars are so much different that it's really hard to, to, to say that there's anything similar between um, one to the other. The biggest thing about having the experience here um, in the Indy car is just knowing the track, knowing where the bumps are, you know, knowing what the corners are like, knowing what to expect the first time I get here in the Bush car. So that's, that's really the biggest thing. There's one other difference. You'll never see him take a sledgehammer to an Indy car. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely a big difference there. All right, uh, there is Sam Hornish. Is, uh, he had a tangle with uh, the 66 of Stephen Wallace. And let's get an update quickly on Kyle Busch's situation. Mike Massaro? Yeah, Marty. They, they, you heard that Kyle Busch radioed in that he felt like he had a right rear tire going down. Well, they brought the car in. They took all four tires off, and the tires are all up, upright. No flat tires for Kyle Busch, but he did radio in saying he just could not keep the car on the racetrack. And he's back into the pits now, so they're going to work, and they're making some other adjustments. And then we got another guy going hefty with the blowtorch. He and Brewer are going to have a party afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> now they use that blowtorch to clean that rubber off so they can check the tire wear. As we get ready to get back to green here, Kyle Busch is just now leaving his pit area. Well, let's go full throttle as we put the hammer down again here in Richmond. Back 
Don't fucking too hard through there. You're all clear. You're fucking outside. Fucking outside. 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 When you fight, what you fight here is trying to get your car turning in the center where you can get a good run off the corner. And a lot of times you have to get it so loose off uh, to, to make that happen. So Denny Hamlin's day could possibly be over as uh, we're going to take you on board as we head to break here at Richmond International Raceway. So far, a lot of action and a lot of it bad for a lot of good drivers. We're under a third caution. Stay with us. to try to win one of these races. Well, for all the uh, action that he, poor Kyle Busch has had, he should have an arcade sponsor because he probably feels like a pinball, but he did get one break. He was the first car down one lap, so he gets the Aaron's Lucky Dog free pass. He's at the tail end of the lead lap. Now, just as we were getting ready to go back to green flag race in the 52 of Brad Teague, all of a sudden caught on fire down the backstretch. Yeah, we saw a big fire under the hood off of the 52 car, and he came down the backstretch with a pretty good amount of speed and drove straight to the fire truck. And what let me this correct it was Kevin LePage. What this probably is is a loose fuel line or an oil line, and we see how the heat is just bubbling the paint right off the hood. That's a tremendous amount of heat. Yeah, he's melting the paint right off of that car. But he is okay, and we're under a continued caution. We never did go back to green flag racing, so still under our third caution for 14 of the 29 laps that we have run. Stay with us. I promise we will get back to green flag racing at Richmond. Beautiful night in Richmond at a beautiful site. The Richmond International Raceway all lit up. Our aerial coverage brought to you by Goodyear, helping NASCAR drivers get to the finish line for the past 25 years. Already under the third caution of this race, latest one coming out a couple laps ago when Matt Kenseth tangled with Denny Hamlin racing for second spot. Kenseth's radio traffic after the crash. I don't even know if we touched, to be honest with you. He came up and it was almost like he saw me at the last minute and hung a left and spun out or something. I'm not even sure we even touched, really. It's so weird. He was real low off of two. Like, he, he gets him and then he slid up and then it's almost like he saw me again and then he just hung a left and spun out.
So Matt Kenseth's side of what happened, and I'm sure we'll hear from Denny Hamlin fairly shortly and get his side of the story. Kenseth running right now in second spot. You see his crew chief, Drew Blickensdurfer, there. The crew chief and the driver will talk a lot tonight about brakes and brake bias. Tim Brewer down at the Chevy Cutaway car. Tell us what that means. Thanks, Alan. What we're going to have here, this is a cable that runs over here to the brake pedal assembly. And what we can do here, when the car burns off a little fuel in the rear of the car, we can dial in a little bit of rear brake right here. It makes the thing turn just a little bit better. Or if the car is loose getting down the corner, you can dial it over here and dial a little bit more front brake in it. Back up to DJ. He can elaborate on this just a little bit more. Yeah, that's a good explanation, Tim. And it shows. And, and normally we have to turn it almost a turn to make any kind of difference. But it's, it's a tool that the driver has inside the race car uh, that we can make that adjustments. And, and usually, uh, just as you said, as we burn off that fuel, then we can start making those adjustments as we know what our car's tendencies are. That is the only adjustment that we let the drivers actually make in the car. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a NASCAR rule, but we probably wouldn't let you work on anything else either. So. <laughs> Crew chief talking there, folks. Hey. Uh, we have caught up with a very disappointed Denny Hamlin, Jamie. Well, Denny has checked out okay. We heard from the other side, Matt Kenseth on the radio. Denny, we heard from Matt Kenseth. He wasn't sure what happened. What happened in, from your driver's seat? Um, I don't know. It, uh, man, it's just really early to be out of a race. But, uh, you know, I heard right at the last minute uh, looking outside, and um, I was on straight away. And, um, you know, it could have been my fault. I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I just wish there were a little more give and take there. I've, I've been in many, many situations like that before, and I've always, I've always gave, and uh, it just, just wasn't enough today. Well, Marty, disappointing day for Denny Hamlin. Started on the pole in front of his family, friends, and everyone. He grew up 20 minutes from here, Marty. Thank you, Jamie. Yes, it is a big disappointment as we have one to go at the line right now. So uh, next time by, the lights will go out on the pace car. What a beautiful view from high above and the Goodyear blimp is. Uh, they're working they're extremely working hard, extremely on the, hard on under the, five the rear car. of this car. That last uh, caution, they came in and, and took the left rear tire off. It looked like, and, and I don't know if they were putting a spring rubber in the left rear end, maybe to, to tighten this car up. And now they're doing something on the right rear. Mike, what's going on with the five? Well, they're struggling, Marty, with a very loose race car. Earlier in the race, you heard Kyle Busch come over the radio saying he thought he had a right rear tire going down. The reason for that was because he felt like the car was spinning out. They brought the car down pit road. The tires looked okay. Now that last time down pit road, they were trying to pull out a spring rubber from the right rear still trying to get some stability in that race car all right thanks for the update mike we'll keep our eyes on the five as uh, he is shown at the very tail end of the lead lap in 38th place yeah one thing they might be doing here because they're at the tail end of this line they can come in here work on the car get a few adjustments in here while it doesn't hurt them to make a pit stop here an extra pit stop yeah and i'll tell you one thing i've raced with that young man for a few years now and and racing around him if he says that race car is loose i'm telling you it's loose because i've seen him in some positions and got him out of loose race cars uh, but he's a, a tremendous driver and they'll keep working on it all right guys pace car is going to pull in that means we're going to go full throttle here at richmond As they come by the stripe, it's Jeff Burton, Matt Kenseth, Dave Blaney, Clint Boyer, Shane Huffman. That's your top five. Then it's Sorensen Biffle. The young kid, Santos, is in eighth, and Montoya got a good restart. He's up to ninth, and there he is, moving around on the 77. Uh, it's staying ahead of the 77 of Harvick. I love watching this 42 car on the restarts. I always keep my eye, one eye peeled on him because I'm telling you, when that green flag comes out, he's ready to go. Let's go back and take you to the restart. Keep an eye on the number 42 Havlin car. I tell you, you put a move on on Kevin Harvick like that. I tell you, that's a that's a pretty strong move. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. Uh, Harvick's known as uh, one of the better restart uh, kings out here, and uh, uh, but Juan Pablo is always ready to go on these restarts, and he does a terrific job. And uh, this is a difficult place to make passes, so he was able to make one and, and get one position on the restart. And you saw that 91 in front of those two. That's Bobby Santos the third. I mean, this kid's impressive right now. Doing a fantastic job staying ahead of them. You see Juan Pablo Montoya getting a little sideways coming off a of two, trying to stay in front of Kevin Harvick here. It yeah, looks like these two are still arguing over that spot. I don't know if Kevin's <laughs> all that happy about the way he, he passed him on that restart. 
And right behind them, you see uh, Carl Edwards. He's just sort of sitting back and watching this and saying, okay, you guys take each other out and then I'll move around. Yeah, and we've seen Harvick, of course, win the last three races here, and, and he's been right around the bottom in doing that every time. Obviously, it hasn't been in his car. It's been in Richard Childress racing car, but you know that he's got a lot of the same stuff, and a lot of it is the feel that Kevin Harvick knows he needs in his car, so I think we're going to see him work that bottom. We see his car uh, coming up uh, on the inside there, too. we got battles everywhere going on right now. Yeah, uh, Stephen Light on the outside and John Wood, who's had a tough couple of weeks uh, trying to make a move on the inside. All right, keep an eye on the 18. That's uh, or, and, uh, of, uh, Brad Coleman. Brad Coleman, right. And he is back in 26th position. Yeah, Scott Riggs in the nine car this week. Uh, he'd made a pit stop uh, two cautions ago and uh, trying to work his way back up through the field now. And he has gotten around Coleman to take that spot. So as you said, we've got action going on all over the racetrack. That's why the fans love to come here. You know, they can watch what's going on up front. They can watch uh, what's going on battles for 10th and 12th. And then you get all the way back to the back. It looks like we've got a battle shaping up uh, now for second place uh, as Dave Blaney's moved into third and uh, is trying to run down Matt Kenseth. Yep, Blaney uh, in third right now, uh, right ahead of uh, Clint Boyer. Let's uh, check in with Dave Burns. What's going on with Dave Blaney? And Marty talked with Trent Owens, his crew team today about their weekend or their day actually, since they did most everything today with these race cars. Started out pretty good right off the truck. Tried a lot of different things and made a big circle ended up right back where they were when they tested here earlier this spring liked the car very much so they went with that setup and obviously working very well for Blaney. Yeah, right in front of him, we see Matt Kenseth again. We've talked about this up on the high side and talked about the momentum and a lot of different things. But the other thing that it can do, it can save your tires a little bit. You're not having to put quite as much steering wheel in it. You can let the car roll and get that momentum off. So he may be, we may see him come on later on with that set of tires. One thing that Matt makes Matt Kenseth such a great race car driver is he was running a certain line we saw earlier. These guys ran him down. Jeff Burton kind of pulled away from him. And then you see him move around, try to find another place on the racetrack. And he looks like he moved up a little bit found a little more grip and here he just eased away from these guys and looks like he might be catching uh, Jeff Burton just a little bit. Well and it took uh, about four laps but Clint Boyer finally gets around and makes the pass on Dave Blaney so he moves into third but it allowed Kenseth to pull away. Yeah just a little bit but uh, as we've seen the last few weeks Clint Boyer and this team uh, have done a terrific job as he got the win at Phoenix uh, just two weeks ago and uh, don't know that this is the same race car uh, but he certainly uh, this Richard Childress Racing organization has a setup that works extremely well right now they're running first and third uh, in this race. Let's get an update on the two car Jamie Little. Marty Clint Boyer said this is the perfect racetrack he said nobody likes following each other around just a few races ago and that in itself is giving him motivation for tonight. Marty? Well, you got your answer there. It is that car. Very same one. He continues to try and reel in the race leaders. Kenseth in front of him and Jeff Burton out in front by 2.3 seconds over third place. Let's check in now with Kyle Busch. He has fought his way back to 26. He just got around Stephen Light for that position. Yeah, that means he's made up about 13 spots uh, since he uh, restarted uh, at the tail end because of making those pit stops here. So he looks like they've got it tightened up for him and uh, he's moving along a lot better. Yeah, you can see how the front end of the car falls down when he drives in the corner, hits those brakes hard. You can see that front end just settles, slammed down on the racetrack. Well, Kevin Harvick just took Bobby Santos the third to school and took over the position as the, the veteran said, rookie, it's time for me to get around you here. And that means uh, Harvick will move into eighth place. Santos back tonight. Yeah, Kevin Harvick just so good at this racetrack. Doesn't matter what he's driving, it seems like. Whether it's Childress's cars, his own cars, uh, cup car, bush car, he loves Richmond. Well, there's the statistics on Kevin. He's currently in eighth place after starting 13th. We're going to step aside for just a few moments. Uh, we've had a bit of action here. Three cautions so far. We're under green on lap 52. Continuing under green here at Richmond International Raceway, just past the 50-lap mark. Mike Wallace out there running with our onboard camera looking at the brakes. 
Andy, I'm starting to look at these rotors, and they look like they're getting up around 1,000 degrees. As they get north of that, what does that do to that bead on that right front tire? What happens to that? Well, Brad, what happens? You see that if, if you didn't know better, you would think that that's just something wrong. That, that rotor's getting so hot. But that's a normal, really kind of a normal temperature for these guys, for, for these rotors at a racetrack like this. But what can happen is that heat can transfer right out of that rotor into, this, into the bead of the tire right here. And if that gets too hot, what it can do is charcoal actually melt that tire and blow out. Now, that's one of the things that these guys worry about, and they try to defend against with brake blowers and stuff. Yeah, I, I'm not sure... I'm sure they're glad they can't see what I'm seeing right now as a driver. Uh, it's a lot. You don't see all of that, obviously, inside the race car. But you, you, we, we're very much aware of that. Our spotters are telling us, are telling these drivers that, hey, be careful. When you, when they're up on top and they're looking down on that, then they can see really good into turn one, and, and they'll let those drivers know if they think they're abusing them. Well, DJ, how do you how do you preserve that? I mean, how, what do you do as a driver? Obviously, your your crew chief saying stay off the brake, stay off the brake. What do you do to preserve that tire and to keep those rotors as cool as you possibly can? Yeah, hopefully, Brad, you've got a good enough handling car that you can just back the corner up a little bit. You know, you'll probably hear some of these crew chiefs say, "Look, float it in for a little while, let the car roll." And if you have a good handling race car, you can do that. If you don't, if the car is a little bit tight, you're trying to use that brake to turn it, so it makes it much more difficult. Well, let's find out more on uh, what we can do to cool down these brakes. Let's bring in Tim Brewer. Tell you what, let's address the bead blower first, guys. What this is, it's a fan motor. We're going to suck the air in here, bring it through this hose right here. We're going to blow it directly on the bead of this tire. That's where the wheel and the tire come in contact. We're going to knock as much heat out of that air as we can. We'll get back a little bit later and show you what we're going to do with the caliper. Back up to you guys. All right, thanks, Tim, as we keep learning more and more of uh, what goes on with all these brakes, especially at these types of tracks, like the three-quarter mile here at Richmond. On board with Jeff Burton right now, and he is getting back into traffic, putting people uh, a lap down. That is the 70 of uh, Justin Dirks, as uh, he is about to go a lap down. And uh, it is Burton up in front of Clint Boyer, then Matt Kenseth, and uh, Reed Sorensen has moved up to fourth now. Dave Blaney rounds out the top five. Yeah, I've been watching this monitor, watching the lap times of these leaders, and uh, Clint Boyer has been running his teammate Jeff Burton down just a little bit each time. It may be that uh, Jeff Burton's in traffic, but Jeff, uh, Clint Boyer definitely is catching Jeff Burton. Yeah, there's no doubt that he's a little bit quicker, but a lot of it depends on where you catch this traffic, and sometimes the leader has a little more difficulty in that because these guys want to race them a little bit harder. They don't want to go that lap down, so they're not willing to give that spot up, and the, the leader has to race a little harder, whereas the guy in second and third, they might get a break because the guys are already a lap down and they catch him in a little better spot. Did you see that move by Jeff Burton? He looked on the outside. Ambrose held position and Jeff just tucked underneath him and put our in-race reporter a lap down. That's the experience against the rookie right there. So Ambrose who is currently running in 32nd. That means we have 31 cars on the lead lap. Yeah that little move right there of kind of hanging up arcing it in really late up high and then kind of swinging down low that's one of the moves you can really make here at uh, Richmond when you're trying to make a pass yeah especially when you have a good handling car like <laughs> Jeff Burton has that's a lot of fun when you've got a car like that and, and Clint Boyer seems to be a lot the same and uh, you know and here we see Jeff Burton having to go on the outside of traffic we see Clint Boyer right behind him going to the inside and we're probably going to see him run a little faster lap time once again so he's closed this down a lot uh, in traffic it looks like his car is right on the bottom Clint Boyer I'm speaking of and uh, can just kind of pass him where he catches him. Well, he's uh, Clint Boyer in the two cars. Got a good look at that 29 car right here, so he knows where he's going to have to beat him. Where you kind of gauge where your car is good when you get within sight of these guys. I mean, you guys kind of use that as saying, "Okay, this is where I think I'm going to make my pass." So you start making plans ahead of time. Yeah, you, you do that. Yeah, you're, you're looking ahead and, and seeing, you know, where you might be gaining a little bit on that guy in front of you and, and exactly, you know, what makes your car a little bit better than his at, at that particular part of the racetrack and exactly what you're going to want to do. I haven't seen Clint Boyer get off the bottom much, so I'm pretty sure he's going to try to make that pass on the bottom when and if he gets to Jeff Burton. But a lot of times, you know, Jeff Burton could have been using that time in traffic just to cool his tires down a little bit and, and not abuse his car, and, and we may see him. Of course, he's going to have a hard time getting any clean racetrack for a while because we have have so many cars uh, now that are struggling. All right, now after three early cautions, we've had an extended period of green flag running, so we'll find out who's good on the long runs. But uh, right now, we're going to step aside. There is the lead up front as Richmond. Well, I'll tell you what, these folks love the racing here at Richmond International Raceway.
Every driver loves Richmond. I think it's a driver's track. I mean, it's a perfect size. It races very well. Uh, you, you can pass at all, you know, areas of the racetrack. It's a great racetrack. The asphalt's getting a little bit older, so there's definitely two grooves there. Richmond, in particular, you know, typically has a couple grooves, and, and, and the racing seems to always be good there, so it's a lot of fun. It's just, it's just a fun place to race, you know, and then you can see why the fans enjoy it. They're really not a bad seat in the house. And check it out. A uh, driver's favorite and a fan favorite, Richmond International Raceway. Yeah, Clint Boyer really does love it because he's the leader now. Happened just a moment ago in traffic and that wide space, he needed about all of it. Check I'm, this out, Brad. Uh, look at that. It's unbelievable. Three wide, almost four at one point. Clint does a great job of getting to the bottom, and he's got some great racing going up, even with Stephen Light right in front of him. Outstanding racing. Here we go. Lap cars in the way. Let's oh, split them. Four wide. <laughs> and Boyer gets through to the race lead. Long green flag run has ended. What is going on? Yellow flags out. And Alan, uh, we have not heard from uh, officials exactly what caused the yellow. And it looks like uh, it was the 70 car of uh, Justin Dirks. He grazed the wall. And uh, so that's why we are in our fourth caution. Let's go back and see if we can see what happened. Oh, got a little contact. Oh. Got an assist. The 56 car. Yeah, the tires uh, getting a little bit worn now. Uh, makes it a little more difficult to go through that corner side by side. I'll tell you what, though, this is uh, a good opportunity for these guys. We're getting towards the end of this run, this first run. These guys needing pit stops. I'm sure we're going to see them all coming down pit road. And it looks like uh, a couple guys will stay out. And here comes the leaders in. Here comes Clint Boyer. And Dave, we're sending it down to you. Second place runner, Jeff Burton, right now. His car a little bit tough to turn in the middle of the corner. Air out of both front tires to make that adjustment on that car. Mike. Matt Kent is struggling with the front end of the car, saying it's loose in, loose off. They've debated a track bar change. Matt Kenseth did not want to have that happen because he thought it would affect the side bite. Four tires. Jamie. And your leader, Clint Boyer, in four tires. Fuel, no adjustments, just like in Phoenix. He said this is a dream car. They've made no changes at all. That's Clint Boyer. He's out and away. And he will be second off the line, as it was uh, Jeff Burton getting out first. And so we have a new lead again as uh, Burton retakes it. Uh, two spots picked up by Biffle in this exchange. He's moved up to the top five. Blaney and Harvick have each slipped the spot. So there's the top eight as they came off pit road. Stay with us. Just back to green flag racing here at Richmond International Raceway. Lap 85 of 250. Jeff Burton, the race leader. Clint Boyer is all over his bumper. Matt Kenseth retorts it. Oh, and another crash involving the 66. That would be Stephen Wallace. We've got other cars involved as well. That's Kennington. Danji in uh, his first start. And the 38 of Jason Leffler also. He got clipped. Not the great style, though. And then here is the uh, 73th. Oh, and another yeah, pit road there, fire. Guys. Stay clear. Uh, 72 flamed up. That's Kennington's car. Brent Rowe was the 73, also involved in this uh, melee. So we are under caution again, which will be our fifth. Three wide in turn three never works too good. No, there's just not enough room. And restarts are what you're always uh, a little bit cautious about here because especially back in the pack where the, the racing is hard and, uh, you know, you're, you're trying to go as hard as you can. You've got lap cars trying to, to get up there and, and get themselves in a position, and uh, this just doesn't work. Let's go on board. I want to go low, go low, go low. All right, all clear, all clear. Cautious out. That was David Rudeman's view as he managed to stay low and clear the crash as we are, as we said, under our fifth caution here at Richmond International Raceway. Remember, we had like 13 at this race last year, so we're still doing okay as there's been a lot of beating and banging on this three-quarter mile track. You know the day is Looking down from high above here at Richmond International Raceway under our fifth caution here, and so uh, let's uh, check in with our in-race reporter, Marcus Ambrose. Dale? Marcus, Dale, Jared, you have a copy? You know what? We are pulling up there. Marcus Dale Jarrett, you have a copy? Yeah, Dale, I got you. 
Hey, we had a good bit of green flag racing there. Were you able to get into a rhythm? And uh, if so, uh, what did you think of your car at that time? And how difficult is it for a driver having all of these cautions in to get back into that rhythm? Well, yeah, you know, we've uh, just been set up a little bit, but we've got a much better car now. We're trying to see who's the lucky dog here. So, yeah, I'm pretty happy. I'm learning the ropes around here at Richmond. And, uh, you know, I'm trying to think of something clever to say, but I can't. So I'll just pass it back to you. That's what we want to hear. Good luck, buddy. Well, we can also give you give him the good news. He is the lucky dog. He may not know it just yet, but uh, he will soon. I think there was some confusion on who was the lucky dog there because the 36 car was actually in front of the 59. But I think, and I saw this restart, when they got ready to come to the green, the 36 car passed to the left. And uh, when he did that in, in advanced his position, that's what uh, NASCAR was not going to, wouldn't allow him to get the lucky dog. So they picked the next car in line and probably penalized the 36. Uh, for, for jumping that actually passing to the left before they come to the restart. So now you know why Marcus Ambrose is back on the tail end of the lead lap in 26th position. Let's check in with uh, Mike Massaro. He's caught up with a very frustrated Jason Leffler. And that's right, Marty. Jason was running 17th when that happened. What did you see? Uh, I just, uh, I think I got hit by the 72 car. You know, it's been a, probably someone shouldn't even be in the race. I don't know who the guy is, but, uh, you know, you are on the lead lap and, He's running like he's on the lead lab and he's just in the way, but it's been a rough stretch for the, you know, everybody on the Great Clips team. Um, they've given me fast cars, you know, and we just, uh, we can't get to the end of the races. It's getting real disappointing here and um, especially a situation like that. But so, I mean, that, that's racing. I've been saying that every week and it's uh, getting tougher and tougher to swallow. That's for sure. And you can hear the frustration in Jason Leffler's voice. Dave? Well, guys, you know, we see a lot of mistakes on pit road because they stand out so much. And in fact, at Phoenix, Tommy Wallace, the rear tire changer for Jeff Burton, had difficulty late in the race, and Jeff ended up back in the pack late in that event. Right now, they picked up a spot on pit road. Tommy's having a good night. But you know, the pressure's on, Marty, because he's got to do it again later. Well, and, and these guys never get enough of the credit. I mean, uh, they really have a, a thankless job. They're the ones jumping over the wall, and if they screw up, we catch it on camera, and, and they feel bad for a long time. Yeah, you see, he's not smiling too much, even though he had a good stop. I think he's kind of nervous about the next one, maybe, but uh, you're right. These guys, you never hear their names mentioned too much or called out when they make a great stop and maybe pick up a spot or two, but, boy, if they ever make a mistake, that's the guy they're pointing at. Yeah, but I'm sure that uh, if we would have had Jeff Burton's uh, radio on uh, when he went out of the pits and got back on the track after that pit stop, he was telling them what a great job he did. Because that's the kind of driver and, and person that Jeff Burton is. He appreciates what these guys do going over the wall each week. Yeah, he's a cheerleader for the team, and uh, he's just a great morale boost for the whole team. Yeah, I found it interesting on those pit stops. Jeff Burton took one of the, the first spots coming in at an opening there, and, of course, Clint Boyer's down at the other end. But Jeff was able to get to his pit. They had a great stop, and then he was able to, to take his pit road speed on out and, and get to the lead. Let's check in once again with uh, Dave. Well, and Marty, I just wanted to follow up with uh, what DJ was talking about with Jeff Burton. You're exactly right. And at Phoenix, when Tommy had that bad spot, he did not reply on the radio. I mean, you're right. He knows what this business is, and it doesn't do them any good to berate the crew members if there's a bad stop, because we all have bad days every once in a while. You know, like forgetting people's name, right, Roger? <laughs> Oh, gosh, what am I going to do with you guys? All right, there's some of the guys down in the crew talking over uh, how things went on that particular stop, and they'll uh, get ready for the next reload. We're approaching 93 laps of 250 here. That means we've got 157 still to go. So uh, still a lot more action as we continue under our fifth caution. So Jeff Burton still leads in front of Clint Boyer, Matt Kenseth, Reed Sorensen, and Greg Biffle. That's your top five. This is Jeff Burton. Back here at Richmond, getting ready to go green. We got a report from Mike Massaro. Keep an eye on the 42. He has no right front brake. He's already burned it out. Coming back to the strike, Jeff Burton continues to lead here. Clint Boyer is in second, Ken's is third, Sorensen and Biffle round out your top five. It looks like Montoya is holding station in that 42 despite the brake problem. 
Yeah, we heard him report that maybe he had a right front brake problem, but uh, maybe maybe it's a little miscommunication here. Maybe it just start fading a little bit. Take a look at number five, Kyle Busch. Could tonight be his night? Remember, he had some early problems, but he's moved back to 15th, guys. Yeah, they did a lot of work under those uh, early cautions uh, with that race car, putting rubbers in, taking rubbers out, and it looks like they've got the car a lot better for Kyle right now, and uh, he's moved his way up uh, quite a bit here because that's not really indicative of what happened starting 17th because he was at the back of the pack at one time. In fact, he was one lap down at one point, happened to get the lucky dog. He just got around the 60 car about a lap and a half ago of uh, Carl Edwards. Edwards lost a lot of positions on the last pit stop because they had trouble getting in and out of the pit box. Yeah, we can see right there, you know, he reported a little bit earlier that his car was, he wasn't feeling the front like he wanted right in the center and, and couldn't get off the corner as good as he wanted. He saw him get to the gas and off of it a couple of different times, so he wasn't able to make that pass. Let's get more on what happened to Carl Edwards during that pit stop. Jamie Little? That's right. He actually locked the brakes up short entering his pit box. They're reviewing it right now. He came in at an angle, so the crew could not, had a hard time, as you can imagine, getting the tires on. They actually had to push the car back at the end of the stop. They adjusted that track bar, made some air pressure adjustments because he was tight in the center. They had to push the car back, and that resulted in losing about five positions for series points leader Carl Edwards. Andy, this is choreographed. If one guy makes a mistake, whether it's a driver or crew man, it all falls apart. It is. It's, it's, like, it's like a dance. Everything's got to happen in order. And I'll tell you, when you have to push a car backwards on a pit road, it kills you. All these guys are coming off, and you're talking about just split seconds that make these spots. And, you know, these guys lost a ton of spots by getting in the pits just a little bit crooked. Let's update uh, you, all of you at home while we were getting that update from Pit Lane and Jamie. Matt Kenseth had gotten around Clint Boyer, so put Kenseth into second. There he is. Boyer drops back to third. Also moved Blaney up to fifth, bump Biffle back to sixth. Yeah, these guys had that pit stop there and a chance to work on their cars and make some adjustments, air pressure adjustments. Some of them we talked about saw uh, maybe some wedge and track bar adjustments. And here we have a swap for sixth place with Kevin Harvick in the 77 going by Greg Biffle in the 16. So Biffle has backed up two positions. Now he's under attack from Shane Huffman. Let's get more on uh, Kevin Harvick from uh, Jamie. Well, guys, he was turning some of the fastest lap times of the night before that last stop, and he came over the radio and said, this car is fast. Keep in mind, he has won here four times. He's going for a four-peat in a row, but this time he is in his own car, the Kevin Harvick Incorporated car in that 77. He told me today, Kevin Harvick Inc. began in Richmond in 2001 with their first ever race. It was in a truck, and they said tonight, if they take home a win, it'll be 10 times bigger than the win with Bobby Labonte last weekend. Yeah, Jamie, and I talked to Wally Rogers, his crew chief, and they were telling me they're trying a little different setup here. It's something they've never done before. He wouldn't tell me. I tried to pry it out of him, so he'd tell me what it was. But it's something that they've never tried before. And uh, it looks like it's working pretty good for them. Yeah, and I'd say Delana's pulling awful hard for that to happen, too, because she probably won't have to pay that driver. And so they'd come out. That'd be a win-win situation. They'd make money all the way around for Kevin Harvick Incorporated. <laughs> Always worried about those dollar signs, those car owners, that's for sure. If you were with us in the pre-race, you heard uh, Brad talking about that. And as, uh, this continues out here. Uh, one other move, Casey Mears has moved into the number nine spot now. He just got around uh, Juan Pablo Montoya. We're watching Shane Huffman. He's one of two non-double duty drivers right now in the top 11. It's he and the rookie, Bobby Santos the third. Yeah, Shane Huffman's a great short track driver. That's where he cut his teeth, where a lot of these guys do. But he was a, a race winner in the Hooters Cup division, and they ran a, a lot of tracks just like this. So this is a good time for him to shine. They've had great race cars this year and had some bad luck. I talked to them in the garage this morning, Wes Ward, his crew chief, and Shane himself. And, you know, this is they were really optimistic. Actually, they didn't think they would qualify well, and they ended up qualifying good. They thought they would race really well, and uh, they're doing it right here. Yeah, and now we see uh, Casey Mears on the bottom in the 24, uh, Juan Pablo Montoya on the bottom, uh, making some time up and, and trying to get their cars uh, closer to the front. Let's get more on Juan Pablo Montoya from Mike Massaro. And Marty, a remarkable run for Montoya inside the top 10, especially considering the technical difficulties he's had to overcome. The beginning of the race, they had radio problems, and now it seems like they have an even bigger problem. Here's Brad Perry. Yeah, like I said earlier, your brakes were uh, as red as anybody's out there. When Carl passed you, we saw no red. And uh, that one time when you passed that 91, the way you floated it in there, you know, I could tell you weren't on the brakes as much. I don't know what it did for you center off, but definitely looked better getting in. 
Still, this team extremely optimistic. Before the race, Brad Parrott jokingly said he should win this race. Why? He said it's a lot like a Formula One race. A couple of long straightaways and a few tight turns. Yeah, Mike, we're looking at the brake. You can see the brake heat inside the wheel of this 42. You know, one thing that Juan Pablo Montoya does and does well is he makes a lot of time getting into the corner, part. using the brakes hard. That's okay. how he wins these races on, on road courses. Okay, well, we'll get that too. So I think that's what they're concerned about. I think Brad's talking to him and trying to get him not to use those brakes quite as hard because what, what Juan's not experienced yet is a brake failure, these brakes where they may even blow the tire out. So this is something he's not quite used to yet. Well, one position in front of him is Casey Mears. You just saw him there for a moment. Uh, that's the 27 lap vehicle of Ward Burton. But the interesting story starting to develop with Casey as there he is he has moved 18 spots guys started 27th and now he's in ninth yeah he just didn't have a good qualifying run i watched him in practice and they were way up on the chart up on the speed chart in practice and they just didn't get a good lap in uh, qualifying yeah we got a battle for six now as we see uh, greg biffle uh, going around dave blaney and it looks like greg's car takes a little bit of time to come in he wasn't very fast on the restart there where dave was a little faster on the restart but his car seems to fall off a little bit so it's interesting to see as these guys have made adjustments what they're looking for i think some of these guys were expecting some long green flag runs like we saw there earlier and that might be they probably took a little bit of air out of their tires to get them hooked up better for that so it's kevin harvick in fifth greg biffle in sixth dave blaney now in seventh and take a look at this battle going on. There's Scott Wimmer going around the 91 of Bobby Santos, and that is four position. So as these longer runs, that's the one that Achilles heel we've noticed with the 91 car. Maybe the rookie's running those tires a little too hard. Yeah, he, he had a great first run there, but then right towards the end of it, he started fading back. And we see him fading back now just a little bit earlier in this run. Uh, you know, this he's done a great job, though, staying. He's been solid, solid so far tonight and staying out of trouble here. Yeah. If he's smart, he'll get a good finish. Yeah, he will. And, and here we see that five car coming again, making his way still, uh, marching up through uh, the field a little bit. So as you can see, David Rudeman now trying to get around him as well. So uh, right now, the rookie is starting to go the wrong direction. Maybe we'll get another caution. As you can see, the heat building in Juan Pablo Montoya's brakes. From the ESPN Pit Studio, Alan Bester, Brad Daugherty with our Holiday and Race recap. Sam Hornish Jr., Indy 500 champion in some trouble. That was lap 13. He and Stephen Wallace got together. Race car, but got, got sideways here right in front of Matt Kenseth. It put him out of the race, and that's just too bad. So Hamlin done at lap 23, and this is going to hurt. Ouch. Mm. Tough break for the hometown boy looking to win before the Richmond fans. It's been a Childress race up front for the lead. Clint Boyer in the two, Jeff Burton in the 29. In traffic, a little three wide around Stephen Light. Uh, excuse me, coming through. <laughs> Boyer led for a bit. Burton got the lead back on a pit stop on a caution flag. Since then, Burton has been out in front and continues to pace this race. And that is our Holiday Inn race recap. But talking about brakes, we saw some of those right front glowing brake rotors. Tim Brewer at the Chevy Cutaway car. Tim, show us some of the things the teams put on the car to try and cool the brakes during a race. Thanks, Alan. What we're going to show is the weakest point of the system right now, and that's the brake fluid. So what we're going to do, we're going to conduct airflow through the front of the car. We're going to accelerate it with these three fans right here, through these hoses, down through the area here. And what we're going to do, we're going to try to cool this caliper as much as possible. Rotor can take a lot of heat. That's not the issue. The weak point is the fluid in here. Once that fluid boils, the, pump, the pad gets real spongy. The brake pedal gets spongy. Stuff starts aerating. That's the reason you don't have any brakes. Back up to you guys. All right, thanks, Tim. And while all this going on, you saw Mike Wallace's Geico car as uh, the brakes were blazing in all their glory. He's running in 21st position. We have a total of 24 cars on the lead lap. And you'll notice now that our race leader, Jeff Burden, in 29, has Clint Boyer in second place. Boyer got around Matt Kenseth just a few laps ago while we were looking at all the brake action. And in fourth place, you got Reed Sorensen under attack from guess who? Kevin Harvick. And Harvick makes it stick. Look out, guys. He's coming. Yeah, it looks like that setup's working pretty good for Kevin. 
Yeah. You know, I, I tell you, if I'm Jeff Burton, those guys up front, I'd be asking, where is that 77? Because he's won three in a row here. You know he's going to be coming to the front. You know, Jamie reported earlier that uh, towards the end of that long run that he felt like he had, if not the fastest, one of the fastest cars on the track. So this is playing right into to his hands, getting this long green flag run again. Yeah, looking at the board and the lap times, he's had some of the fastest laps here in the last uh, 20 or 30 laps. And the other car is uh, the 24 of Casey Mears, who's now moved up to seventh. Yeah, Casey's had a good car here all day today in practice and everything else, like I said, so I'm not surprised to see him up front. Yeah, yeah, it seems like we talk about this team every week, about how much improvement they're, they're having uh, on a weekly basis. Uh, they've run in the top ten uh, almost since Daytona, uh, where they had a lot of problems there, but uh, they're doing a terrific job. There he is. Let's get more on him from Dave Burns. And he's picked up a lot of positions on the track. Very good race car for him. But he also got three of the, what they call free ones. What, what are free ones, DJ? Free <laughs> ones on pit road, right? Yeah, that's a good thing. <laughs> His crew had a really good pit stop that first time, and they uh, restarted 10th on the last restart. He had come in on in the 13th position. So that's a way to move forward here at Richmond. Some on the track, some on pit road. Well, he has four top five so far this year, as best being second out at Fontaine. Tana, and right now he continues to run at a very good clip 22.8 seconds as we said in seventh spot. Yeah you know it, that just shows you you get something good happening we've got a problem with uh, Tony Range in the 33 car right now. Looks like it maybe looks, a right front. He's definitely got something on the right side down. And yeah, this could be exactly what Andy was talking about earlier you run those cars hard that you build up that heat and he does have a right front down. Yeah, I'd be interested to see what made that tire go down, but it's very possible that that brake heat could have charcoaled that bead and, uh, and just burn it up and the air goes out of the tire and it goes flat. Well, he has made it to pit lane. We will stay green. It'll uh, cost Tony Raines any chance he had of uh, getting back into uh, contention as he will go several laps down. Now let's uh, see the battle for ninth. That's Shane Huffman being passed by our points leader, Carl Edwards. So put Edwards up to ninth, drop Huffman back to 10th. Yeah, we were just talking, Andy and I were just talking, noticed that he, Carl was turning some very fast laps too. He's lost a lot of time on the racetrack uh, to the leaders, but I think we got a caution in turn two now. Got a crash up in turn number two. The 56 is now banged into the wall. That will bring out our sixth caution of the day. And uh, that's Danji Hannaford as uh, so he has backed it hard into the turn two wall. Yeah, he shortened the back end of that thing up pretty good. We see the 36 oh. car turned around also. Didn't see that the uh, Sherman was also involved in that. He was a couple of laps down already, but uh, don't see as much damage there. Maybe the two of them had contact. We didn't get to see exactly what happened as it transpired. Yeah, this is Hannaford's first There's bush race. Out here. Want me to come this time? And uh, he was, I talked to those guys down in the garage and he was pretty optimistic. He's, he's been running some of those Hooters Cup races, kind of like we talked about Shane Huffman has done and some of these other guys have cut their teeth in that division. And uh, he drives for this team. This team also has a Hooters Cup car. So this is their first start with him. Well, David Gilliland is going to be our Aaron's lucky dog. He'll get the free pass. Uh, it means we will have 21 cars. He'll be in 21st position after he comes around. Mike Wallace is one lap down at the uh, 22nd spot. In fact, we have a total of uh, seven cars that are one lap down. You know, we see some of these guys, uh, the, the guys that maybe don't have a lot of experience in this series, just like Andy was talking there. But after they've run a while and these tires uh, losing a lot of their grip, uh, that's when you seem to, to have more of the problems. You're, you're still trying to drive that car in. And, and then, you know, maybe they haven't learned to adjust that brake bias yet and, and just things like that. And they're not prepared uh, to back the, the racetrack up a little like some of the guys like Jeff Burton and, and uh, these guys are doing to, to make their cars work and, and go faster at a different part of the racetrack. We've passed halfway. Crew chief, tell me what adjustments now. You've seen your car over two long shifts. Well, I'm talking to my driver right now and trying to get exactly what he needs because this could be, you know, one of the last pit stops and chances we get to adjust on it. And I'm sure all the leaders are going to be on pit road right here. Well, as they uh, pull in, here comes Jeff Burton leading the uh, feeding frenzy and we'll send it down to Dave Burns. And Marty, you want to get that last possible pit stop right. Kirchie Pat Smith made a last minute decision. They had set two of tires out there. That was a scuff set at the last second. He said set five. They grabbed a sticker set. 
no wear on these tires at all. And they put them on with a slight air pressure adjustment. Mike. Just after the last pit stop, Matt Kenseth radioed in. He had a slight vibration. Drew Blickensdorfer wanted to know how that was. Matt Kenseth says it's about the same. They don't think it's anything serious, though. Maybe a tire out of balance. Jamie. Clint Boyer came in second. They took a half pound out of the right rear. He said his car is a bit loose. Dan Deeringhoff, his crew chief, you hear on the radio, took last weekend off to get married, and he's back with his man, Clint Boyer. So now to be the battle for the race off, and it looks like uh, Burton holds station. Uh, Biffle have managed to move up one position to fourth. Kevin Harvick drops one position. And look at Scott Wimmer. Four positions. He's into the top ten in eighth. We've had a lot of action at the action track. here at Richmond International Raceway. We have 108 laps still to go. Let's take a look at our Castrol GTX lap leaders. And you can see that Jeff Burton has led the most so far, a two-time winner this year in the Bush Series. Denny Hamlin had 20, and they were all early in the race. He is out uh, after the crash. And Clint Boyer, who is currently in second place, has led 10 laps. What's uh, going on with our points leader? Well, Carl Edwards is back in 10th position, had a bad pit stop, fought his way back from that one. And of course, as everybody knows who's followed the series, he has a huge lead in the points. We talked to him about it. We've had enough luck and things have worked out that we do have a big point lead, but I mean, I've seen the point leads go away. You know I mean? We could, I mean, we've had transmissions break and I've wrecked and you do that for a couple weeks in a row and the point lead's gone. So for me, it's just about focusing on each race and performing the best we can. Yeah, we were just looking at uh, the 60 car. We can see this, see this left front tire right here. It almost looks flat right there. If you look at it, these guys are running about 10 pounds or even less sometimes starting out in these runs because of that heat we see in those brake rotors builds that temperature not not just the brakes but also the just the running of the tire builds that much pressure and uh, that's why they run they start these cars out so low on air pressure the tires almost look flat yeah and, and, and as we talk about some guys cars not coming up to speed as fast as others uh, that could be a good reason because they're they're wanting that long run, and, and so that's one of their tools that they use to, to make their car better in that. Well, remember, guys, he won this race back in 05. He only led the last lap. That was the only one he led in that entire race. He, who knows? Maybe he can pull it off again. Our aerial coverage brought to you by Goodyear, helping NASCAR fans get to the finish line for the past 25 years. Man, isn't that a spectacular sight with all the lights? And that new grandstand, that's in the left side of your screen. It's... Uh, big monster isn't it <laughs> it is well i'll tell you what that makes it kind of look like that bristol racetrack where they they can line that up all the way around the racetrack if they did that here they could put about five hundred thousand in here i bet well while we've got a moment let's talk about what's coming up on the nhra power Ed drag racing series they'll be at st louis this weekend last week if you saw it 24 year old ashley force took down daddy in the first round What's going to happen this week? Qualifying coverage begins on ESPN2 tomorrow at 5 Eastern. And the final round on ESPN2 Sunday night at 7 Eastern with Paul Page, Mike Dunn, and the entire crew. And uh, it looks like lights are out on the pace car, which means we will be going back to green flag racing next time by. We've got 105 laps to go. Yeah, I'll tell you what, I'm, I'm a little concerned when we watch these green flag runs and we see those tires like we saw on that 33 car go down. About 40 or 50 laps, these guys with these brakes getting so hot. Uh, I'd be, if I was crew chief, I'd be a little bit concerned about that if we have a good long run. Well, we'll keep our eye on it because that means we could be somewhere around lap, uh, what, 70? 70 to go, maybe, 70, yeah. Somewhere around there. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to crank it up one more time as the pace car gets ready to pull in. Hammer down, let's go full throttle at Richmond. Well, I could tell which radio was Jeff Burns when he says, a great start. You're clear. <laughs> he was sailing. 
Yeah, he's been pretty clear all night, pretty much, unless that uh, that one time that Clint got by him. He's got a good lead right here off the start. I'll tell you what, he shot it out like it was in a cannon. Yeah, Jeff's car seems like that, that they have everything just right for him. I mean, the car, he can drive it off in the corner with a lot of speed, not use a lot of brake, carry that speed through the center on the bottom, or if he needs to go up a little bit and uh, gets a really good run off the corner. Let's take a look at the Dish Network telemetry. And we see him working that throttle. And you see how hard that brake, he's pushing that brake really hard. You see a lot of red pop up there. He's able to use a lot of throttle off turn four. Here's what it looks like inside. Looks easy, doesn't it? <laughs> it looks easy from here. Yeah. Not much has changed behind him. Uh, in fact, uh, the only position change, Scott Wimmer has gotten around Kyle Busch, put Wimmer up to eighth, Kyle back to ninth. But uh, right now, Burton's trying to check out a little bit here. Yeah, he's got a good short run car. It looks like Clint reels him in just a little bit. And there's some other guys coming from behind. We've been talking about Kevin Harvick, Carl Edwards. These guys work kind of work trap. Now we see Matt Kenseth passing Clint Boyer. Looks like Clint Boyer's got a good long run car. His car comes around after they run five or uh, uh, 25 or 30 laps. And, uh, you know, these first five or 10 laps, he's not as fast as these guys. So move Kenseth up to second, bump Clint Boyer back to third. And Carl Edwards has now pushed his way into ninth. Kyle Busch back to tenth. Here comes Kevin Harvick on the inside, uh, trying to get uh, that fourth spot away from Greg Biffle. And uh, it seems that Kevin takes just a couple of laps to get his car going. But when it comes on, uh, his car is really fast from that point on. Let's get more on the 77. Jamie Little. Well, you guys are exactly right. We're hearing a lot about these cars are better in the long runs. Clint Boyer, you guys touched on him. Now, talking about Kevin Harvick, the team is making him well aware that he has been one of the fastest cars, if not the fastest car, for most of the evening. As I talked about Kevin Harvick being in his own car, I talked to Wally Rogers, his crew chief. He said having Kevin in the car, well, he wears him out, but he said it makes the team that much better. They love working for their boss behind the wheel. Dave? Jamie, two cars behind in the 24. Casey Mears people handed me a note with no changes indicated on the note on that last pit stop. So I checked with Chad Ball to the crew chief. He said, no changes. We think the two car in the long run is really the only car better than us. Funny he didn't mention the 77. So they think they're dealing with Clint Boyer. They think they've got a great race car and they don't want to touch it too much and uh, mess up Casey. He's having a good run. Yeah, well, I'm going to tell you, Dave, anybody who counts out the 77 is going to be making a huge mistake. Don't go away. Does Harvick pull it off, winning four straight and tying Mark Martin for the most wins here in Richmond with five? Come on back and find out. NASCAR Bush Series racing at Richmond monopolized by Kevin Harvick over the last year and a half, September 05. Green white checkered finish. Kevin Harvick takes the checkered flag. He followed it up in May of 06 by outrunning his children's teammate Jeff Burton for the victory. And then last September, awesome. Jeff Burton challenged early, then had a mechanical problem, and Harvick dominated three straight. Richmond NASCAR Bush Series wins. He is trying to make it four straight. What a place this racetrack has been for Kevin Harvick. Look at those numbers. 12 races, eight top five finishes, nine top tens, four wins. That's a batting average that any hitter would like to have, let alone a race driver at a place as tough as Richmond. Let's check in on Harvick and the rest of the top 10 runners will take you up to speed, starting with Dave Burns. And right now, the leader of the race is complaining about his race car. Jeff Burton said the rear grip is no good in this car, and you can see Matt Kenseth reeling him in. Mike? We heard about Matt Kenseth being described as a perfectionist at the beginning of the show. Well, he hasn't been completely satisfied with his car all evening yet. He's running second right now, feeling pretty good as Jamie covers Clint Boyer. That's right, Clint Boyer. His car has been just a little loose tonight, but as the guys were saying in the booth earlier, his car has to come to him. It's better on long runs. It's not good off his start, and as you see, he gives up positions. So Clint Boyer in that car that he won with in Arizona, guys, he's hoping he can bring it home tonight. Right behind him, Kevin Harvick in the number 77, and we have a change in the lead, guys. Certainly do, as it is Matt Kenseth getting around the ill-handling 29 of Jeff Burton. So uh, that gives us another lead change here. It'd be our fourth different lead change. 
So as this continues, let's pick up our up to speed and catch up with Kevin Harvick, Jamie Little. He's in fourth. That's right. Very exciting battle up front, but exciting for Kevin Harvick, Inc. You know, he started 13th. This is his 13th start in Richmond. Perhaps that will be his lucky token to bring home that record-breaking fifth win here. Kevin Harvick, I asked him today, why run in your own car? He goes, you know, I've won 20-something times for Richard Childress. This is a great challenge for me. Hey, Burns. Last Sunday in the Nextel Cup race, Casey Mears had a big crash at Talladega. Was a little bit sore, but glad that all of his safety equipment worked. So far today, a very good race car. And as we reported, they didn't change it much on that last stop. Just a little bit loose right now, Jamie. Well, Greg Biffle's hanging in there. He told me today, if we can finish this race, that will be a victory for us. They have not finished the last three races. Greg Biffle has had his work cut out for him in this 16 car, but he's been running solid right now. It's the best all night. Started sixth, he's sixth now. Behind him, Scott Wimmer, as you guys talked about earlier, he was not scheduled to be in this 21 car. That was supposed to be Timothy Peters. They made the change this week on Monday. They wanted to put that veteran driver of Scott Wimmer behind the wheel at Richmond, a track like this. They need to get the top 10. They said at Richard Childress, he says and expects from all three teams to be in the top 10 at every race. Behind him, Carl Edwards, our current series. Terrific run right now for Reed Sorensen running ninth. This has to be a, a big morale booster for that team. Brian Patty said before the race they have not finished on the lead lap all season with Reed Sorensen behind the wheel. The guy rounding it, the guy rounding out the top ten has been Kyle Bush, who is expected to contend for the win tonight. That has not been the case. They've had a litany of problems. Kyle just recently came over the radio saying the car is now turning better, but he doesn't have enough front grip to compete for the win tonight. Alan. Pretty huge rally for Kyle Busch, Mike, as she's back into the top 10 after being as low as 39th in some early troubles in this race. Well, Jeff Burton has dominated tonight, but right now he's looking ahead, trying to keep up with Matt Kenseth in the traffic. Kenseth for Roush Racing. Out in front as we get into the final laps here at Richmond. Roush Fenway having a very fine night tonight. Check it out. This ESPN telecast of the NASCAR Bush Series at Richmond is available in high definition on ESPN 2 HD presented by Vizio. Getting down to the business end of this one, closing in on the finish. Brad Darty, our fan's voice here in our ESPN pit studio with me, and you've been watching and wondering. Uh, DJ, I want to ask, what, last week at Talladega, obviously the, the, the race was mentally taxing. You run three or four wide for long stretches. As we watch this race tonight, and as they're having these long runs, how difficult is it physically to get up on the wheel and continue to push these race cars? Yeah, you've got it nailed exactly, Brad. Uh, this is a difficult racetrack. Even though it's only three quarters of a mile long, you spend a lot of time turning the car, working the car through the center of the corner, and it really wants to throw you over in the right side of the seat. So being in good physical condition helps you a lot there. Your neck wants to get tired, but if you work hard like a person like Carl Edwards, as we all know, does, uh, then that helps you a lot. You know, and I figured out a number of years ago, these crews work extremely hard on these race cars to pick up a half a tenth or a tenth of a second. That's huge in working on the cars. So if I made myself better than the other guys that maybe didn't work out quite as hard, and I'm sure Carl looked at that too, then I can be in better shape as we have these type of long runs at a place like Richmond. And that's why you might see some of these guys come on. It might not just be their car. It might be their physical conditioning. And as we've just passed the top of the hour, if you're just tuning in, we're at Richmond International Raceway at the 11th race of the NASCAR Bush Series for 2007. Our race leader is Matt Kenseth and number 17 Dish Network Machine. Jeff Burton, Clint Boyer, Kevin Harvick, and Greg Biffle round out the top five. And we have 66 laps to go. And the reason I bring that up is a few minutes ago, we were talking to Andy Petrie about the fact that we better keep tabs on these brake rotors and that bead lock that uh, Tim Brewer was telling us about earlier is that get, just gets a little too hot on these long runs. Yeah, we can even see it on Matt Kenseth's car. He's leading the race and, and uh, has a pretty good lead, but we can see it even in his car. We see that brake heat that is really glowing inside that wheel. Let's get a good shot of it right here getting in the corner. And, uh, you know, these guys, which Matt is pretty good about floating his car. We call it floating it in the corner where you don't use a lot of brake. But this is just a racetrack that just takes a, you have to stop that slow that car down so much to make these tight turns. 
Well, you just saw Kenseth go around the 91 of Bobby Santos the third. He was the last car on the lead lap. And that now means that we have 19 cars on the lead lap. And uh, the 17 of Matt Kenseth is uh, zeroing in on uh, Reagan Smith in the number four car. And he is now the next victim. Yeah, Matt's jumped out to a 1.2 second lead. And, you know, they work extremely hard on this race car. And I think we see this time and again. We, we talk about Matt laying back at some places. I think he just waits till they get that race car like he likes it. And he obviously knows what he's looking for in that race car. And they do a terrific job of adjusting. And it looks like they've got it on a rail right now. Well, let's find out how they're feeling down in pit lane. Mike Massaro, what's going on? Well, Marty, this weekend is reminiscent of what transpired in Texas. Remember how Matt Kenseth said before the race he was not feeling all that confident about the car? You remember what happened there, right? He went to victory lane. Well, earlier today, he said the car was not driving well. It was riding through Blickensdurfer throughout the day trying to really dial that car in. It was looking for a tenth here, a tenth there, trying to make it perfect. Well, it seems like the perfectionist is tired of finishing third and is really pedaling hard trying to get that victory here in Richmond. Dave? Mike, this race tonight for Jeff Burton is somewhat similar to the California race that he lost earlier this year when the best set of tires was not on his car at the end of the race. When they made that set change on that pit stop at the last moment, Pat Smith was saving that set for the last, the good set. Right now, Jeff complaining no rear grip at all. Rear grip is here on pit road in the form of four Goodyear tires with an air pressure adjustment. Hope he gets to put them on. I saw a little bit of a wheel there from him as he's going around Bobby Santos. Yeah, we've seen that kind of every time that we've had the camera behind Jeff Burton's car. You can see it want to kick out as he comes off the corner. And that's a little bit aggravating and frustrating from a driver's perspective because you haven't done anything except put on four more Goodyear tires. And it's not that the tires are bad. They're just not working well with your setup right now. So I'm sure that Jeff is hoping that they're going to have another caution at some point because he'd like to put another set of tires on as we see a battle for sixth place developing. It's Casey Mears in the uh, 24 and uh, Carl Edwards in seventh right behind him. And for all you Denny Hamlin fans, you want to talk about perseverance. The team after that early wreck, they've got him back out. He's 168 laps down, but they're not giving up. There's Casey Mears as he gets around the 66, who's several laps down. That's Stephen Wallace. He's in 34th. Meanwhile, up front, it's Matt Kenseth ahead of Jeff Burton as it's Ford and Chevy duking it out here at Richmond. Closing in on the finish of the Circuit City 250 NASCAR Bush Series on ESPN2 from Richmond International Raceway. It is Matt Kenseth out in front of Jeff Burton and Clint Boyer with the checkered flag nearby. Those brake rotors we've been talking about and looking at all night are just one piece of a very complex system. Absolutely, Alan. Back when I ran in the truck series here in late 98, we had a lot of problems with the actual caliper. The piston inside of the caliper would get so hot it would melt the O-ring. It used to be a metal material that made that piston. But I wanted to go down to Tim Brewer and, and talk to him about the materials they use in that little piston now because that's changed over the years. You're right there, Brad. We're in a deal right now to where exotic metals come into play. Years ago, we used to have this round O-ring right here. It would only take so much pressure because it just had a real narrow band right here. Now we use a square O-ring. Holds more square inches, more pedal pressure. But this piston that you're referring to used to be aluminum, now it's titanium. Dissipates heat really well. Back up to you guys. Got all the fancy metals there, but sometimes it's still not enough. I'll tell you what, watching some of the smoke off the right side of Matt Kenseth's car and Wondering about that. What do you think, Mr. Petrie? What are you seeing? Well, Alan, I've noticed that too. We see the 17 car. He's, he's running fine. We see him go in the corner, and every now and then you see a little bit of smoke, a little whisper of smoke kind of coming from the right side. And what that is is that right front tire rubbing the fender. You see these guys that have these four bind setups, and they just maximize the thing, the travel so much that it gets that tire up against the hood. I think that's what we're seeing out of the 17. And also, while we're looking there on the right side, that's uh, David Rudiman getting around Juan Montoya for 11th position. All right, let's go back to the uh, smoke on the 17. Is it something where he has, we've got enough laps here, 46. Could he cut that tire down? Well, that's not the way it happens, though, usually, Marty. What happens with that bead of that tire? It doesn't go all at once. You really don't see it smoking. It just kind of just lets go. I think what we're seeing there is, is not really so much from the brake heat, but the tire rubbing the top of the hood or the fender. Just from because he's traveling it so much. You know, the, max, the maximum travel is taking it down there. 
And I think he's okay with that, Rob. It looks like it's just a split second. It doesn't seem like it's every lap. It's maybe whenever he tries to, to get just a little bit more out of it going into the corner, and it slams that down on it for just a second. Well, he continues to lead Jeff Burton by 1.4 seconds. Now, let's go on board with Mike Wallace in the uh, Geico car, and you'll see as he goes in, and it'll light him up. I'll tell you what I see right here. Mark, Mike Wallace's rotor is not nearly as red as it was earlier in the race, and he could have already had some brake issues because we see he's really slow getting in the corner and not driving it down in there, and you see that when he does get on the brake, you're just seeing a very little bit of color, which means he's not getting much out of the brake. Well, and he is now three laps down in 30th position, so that might be uh, backing up what you're observing. Yeah, he could have already had some problems, maybe worn the pad completely out. Don't really know exactly what it could be, but we're definitely not seeing the heat in the rotor that we should see right there. Now, and you start seeing some of that smoke, uh, we're getting more metal to metal there probably in getting that because it usually if you have enough pad there uh, against that rotor, then it, it, you're not going to see that much of that. All right now you see our race leader. He's got some uh, lap traffic in front of me. Sneaks underneath the 88 of Shane Huffman and also gets around the nine with Scott Riggs behind the wheel. Yeah, Matt's lap times have slowed down just a little bit uh, as he's just been being careful, I think, working the traffic. And probably the other thing is he's seen this race has gotten spread out now, and there's a good chance that they're going to go to the finish uh, without a caution here. So he's probably saving a little bit of that race car at this particular time, knowing that he has a little over a second lead. And as, uh, this continues. We have 41 laps remaining here of the 250. We can tell you that uh, Kansas lead is now down to 1.3 seconds. So nobody's really coming on and charging. It. We're getting deeper and deeper into this run. Well, I do see Clint Boyer making right. some headway. He's consistently one of the, or probably the fastest car on the racetrack. So I see him making just a little bit of ground on that. Yeah, maybe playing right into his hand, uh, exactly what they're wanting. Well, here's two issues for you. This is the longest green flag run we've had all night with 40 laps to go. Now the question becomes, when do these guys have to stop for fuel? We'll answer those questions when we come back here to Richmond International Raceway as 39 laps as Kenseth and Burton have both won this year on the Bush Series. So is Clint Boyer, who's in third, and of course, Kevin Harvick. Here at Richmond International Raceway, we've got 31 laps remaining here in the 11th stop of the 2007 campaign as uh, Matt Kenseth continues to lead. Let's take a look at our Castrol GTX lap leaders, and you'll see that uh, Jeff Burton has the most at 136. As we've had a different total of four different leaders, six total lead changes here tonight. And Kenseth lead right now over Clint Boyer. 2.4 seconds. 14 cars still on the lead lap. And behind Boyer, it's Jeff Burton. And then it's Kevin Harvick and Greg Biffle rounding out the top five. We found out what happened to Mike Wallace, why those brakes weren't glowing so uh, much. Well, it's, oh, look out. That was Yaley getting into and turning around the 28. So we will probably go yellow. And yes, we have. So now it will be our eighth caution of the evening or is it the seventh right, we'll check on that well that happened right in front of matt kenseth too yeah i saw some of those leaders going around the 28 car when he was sitting in the middle of the racetrack it'll be our seventh caution officially let's take another look at it oh bang. yeah jj yaley just got underneath the 28 car got loose turn right had to chase the car up and up and got into the side of him all right, let's talk a little strategy because we're now down to 28 laps to go. We've had our longest stint under the green. Do you go four tires, two tires there, crew chief? I'm going four tires for sure right here. Driver, what, what do you want? <laughs> yeah, I'm a hollering four tires. <laughs> They've been out there a long time, and I think you're going to see uh, whoever's going to win this race is going to have four tires. On. And it is, as we said, our seventh caution. We want to put a period on Mike Wallace. The reason his brakes weren't glowing. Well, he's got a motor problem. Here we go with the last round of pit stops. Dave Burns, we're checking in with you first. Marty, this is the opportunity that Jeff Burton did not get in California. They do get the chance to put on the best set of tires, according to crew chief Pat Smith, that they have for the night. They'll be scuffed tires, and they will uh, be very little adjustments air pressure-wise in the 29. Mike. 
This is not the caution race leader Matt Kenseth wanted to see. They had the fuel to go the distance. They felt like if they stayed on the racetrack, though, they'd be sitting ducks. Matt Kenseth came over the radio saying, let's put it on four and hope for the best. Jamie? And Cliff Boyer in that number two car, they did not want to caution either. They're better on the long runs. They did four tires, fuel, and air pressure adjustment, and he's out, guys. So it looks like, uh, did Boyer get off first in the pit lane? Yeah, I believe Clint Boyer's uh, crew did a terrific job there. We actually saw uh, just a little bit on Jeff Burton's car, just a, a small uh, problem there. So it is Clint Boyer, the big winner here, as he's first across the stripe. Then it is Jeff Burton in second place. So another lead change. Matt Kenseth now in third. What's going to happen? Stay with us. Looking down on the Richmond International Raceway as we get set to go back racing here in these final laps and pit road summary. Take two of those positions out because two guys stayed on the track. We'll get to that in just a second. But Matt Kenseth lost an additional two spots first to third on the pit stops because of trouble on the right side of the car. Watch the jack man and the right front tire here Brad. Alan we talked about Jeff Burton at Phoenix having the problem that cost him the race. This is the money stop. This is the one that you have to hit perfectly in out clean efficiently and they, they had a tough time on that right front. This may cost him the race. Let's see how it turns out upstairs Marty 23 laps to go and it is Carl Edwards and uh, Dave Reagan staying out front and uh, how long they'll stay there with uh, those worn tires. We'll find out pretty quick. You see John Wood driving trying to drive underneath Carl Edwards. I, I can't believe that this is going to you know this is going to work without getting some tires. I'm sure these four tire guys are going to be coming. Well you got to think that that's going to be the move uh, you know. I know that Carl had a good handling car and it, it was better on the long run and these guys are getting held up back there a little bit so uh, it could be interesting but I think uh, eventually the four tires will win out. Uh, Jamie you've got more on Carl Edwards situation. Yes exactly Marty his crew chief Pierre Cattell decided to roll the dice and keep Carl out there to lead the laps. You know why? Back in 2005 they took the same risk and guess what they ended up in victory lane. Will it work again? We'll find out here in just a matter of about 30 laps. Yeah, but, but they only led one lap in that race. They've got to lead about 24 in this one. <laughs> yeah, they've got some hungry guys right behind them, too, that, that are going to be coming. And the other thing that he's got to deal with are a couple of lap cars that have tires also. So that, that's going to keep Carl from running as fast as he can. As we see John Wood on the inside of him right now. And John Wood is a lap down, guys. So, I mean, he is lap traffic. So if he's already getting around him, here comes the rest of them. Yeah, we see in our picture now Clint Boyer, uh, and uh, Jeff Burton and Matt Kenseth working their way there. And, you know, we still have 20 laps to go. So it might look like that it's a little bit close right now, but I believe uh, that they'll, here in just a couple of laps, you're going to really see these four tires take over. Now, I think it's going to be real costly for, for Carl Edwards to stay out here. These four tires are going to just take off, and he's going to find himself looking at a lot of guys going by. Yeah, and I think one thing uh, is that, as we see, Clint Boyer is taking the lead now. Uh, that he got Clint got through the traffic a little bit better than lap traffic there and uh, it would be interesting to see if he can hold off his teammate and Jeff Burton right now because he got him a really good run. We know he hasn't been that good on the, the short runs uh, throughout the race but they might have made that adjustment to help him this time. But the one thing he's got right now now he's got the lead he's got the track position he's got the clean air. This is something he really hadn't had on these short runs early. He's had to earn that position. He, he did lead the race, but it, it wasn't in the early part of the run. Yeah, and the other thing that, that he's got is uh, Matt Kenseth back there trying to get around Jeff Burton uh, for second place. So as long as those guys race, uh, he's going to be happy out front. So it is Boyer, Jeff Burton, Matt Kenseth, Carl Edwards, and Edwards is going the wrong direction. Kevin Harvick rounds out the top five. You're on board right there with Jeff Burton looking back at Kenseth. Yeah, we saw the front of Matt's car really slam down. These guys are driving them off in the corner. I mean, it's showtime now, so they're trying to get everything that they can out of it. Well, we've got to take one more break before we head to the checkered flag. Who's going to take this one? Boyer, Burton, and Kenseth are duking it out up front, but look out. Here comes Kevin Harvick. He's in fourth. Check it out. We've 
Got nine laps to go here at Richmond International Raceway, and what has happened to Clint Boyer since this last round of pit stops? He has checked out. He's got a two-second lead over Matt Kenseth in second, Jeff Burton in third, and Kevin Harvick ran it up to the wall a few laps ago, slid back and lost some time. He's running in four, so his chances of winning four in a row have almost disappeared. Yeah, probably so. And, and we, you know, we talked about Clint Boyer. What did they do? I'm sure that that crew said, okay, we're not going to have a long run here, so let's make an adjustment uh, with our air pressure here. You know, we have, uh, and the crew chiefs have, the ability to kind of know how much they want those tires. They want a finishing pressure on that, so they pump those tires up knowing where they're going to run the best. And we haven't seen Clint uh, with this type of setup actually tonight with his tires, so I think that he showed if he needed to be fast, he could be. All they had to do was make a little bit of air pressure. You saw the gap from first to third. Let's get more on Jeff Burton, Dave Burns. And Marty, his car needed to be just a little bit tighter going into the turns and the air pressure adjustment they made, even though it was a good set of tires, has made that car way too loose going in. Jeff very frustrated and not with a winning race car right now. Six laps remaining and he's got a lot of ground to make up. There's Kyle Busch. It looks like Kyle may make it to the finish. That's a battle for fifth with Greg Biffle. Biffle's got it. Busch wants it. Hey, Kyle Busch done a great job. Him and that team keeping that car in contention and getting back up there and fighting for a top five finish. Brad Darty predicted he would make it into the top ten. So far, he's right on that one. He went for the under on ten or less on cautions. He's got seven. Brad's having a pretty good night. There's a lot of guys out on the track that can't stay the same. <laughs> yeah, but Kyle Busch and his team can be proud of what they've done tonight. You know, they've had a fast car all year. They just have had a lot of things to go against them, and they had some things to work against them here tonight with a very loose race car at the beginning. It got them a lap down uh, in trying to make that adjustment on pit road, but they fought back to get inside the top ten, and now they're battling to get in the top five. Nothing has changed up front as you're watching this. The best battle on the racetrack with about three laps to go. It is still Clint Boyer running about 1.6 seconds ahead of Matt Kenseth. There he is. His best Richmond finish in four races in his career. Seventh last May. Let's check the time this time by and it uh, Boyer was 1.6. Now it's 1.5 but there's only two laps remaining. Well, he did such a terrific job on that restart uh, of working through the, the lap traffic and get himself positioned to pass Carl Edwards uh, and David Reagan, who had stayed out on their tires. And, and that's really the, the winning move here uh, as we get down to the end of this race. So Clint Boyer into the final time around this three-quarter mile track here at Richmond. He's got lap traffic in front of him, but I don't think it's going to matter. There's the gap back to Matt Kenseth. You saw the Dish Network car around turn four. And for the second time this year, Clint Boyer is going to see the checkered flag first at Richmond. Good call, man. Good job. That's the battle for fifth, and it's going to go to Kyle Busch over Greg Biffle. So it's Boyer, Kenseth, Burton, Harvick, and Bush. That's your top five as the celebration is about to begin down in the pits. You know, we asked, uh, it came up earlier in the show, would uh, a Bush regular get in or somebody that's not a, a cup regular get into the top 10? And Scott Wimmer uh, took one of Richard Childress's cars, number 21, and got himself in 10th place. It's a great job for him. <laughs> Let's check in with Mike Massaro. Marty, believe it or not, this car is now perfect. The only other time it had been on the racetrack was in Phoenix. They were in victory lane there as well. How would you describe this race car? That's a pretty neat old race car right here. Uh, proud of all the guys, especially the guys back at the shop who put these things together. I mean, we just keep building cars and keep racing them, and uh, can't thank, thank those guys enough. How much did it pay off concentrating on getting off to good starts in the early parts of the run? That's what you guys concentrated on during the test here in March. And it was really until the last run, I think, until we got the uh, thing going on the first few laps there and uh, learned a little bit right there in the last run and uh, came here and tested. Didn't really find nothing to help us there. Worked on all day today. Still didn't find anything. Thankfully, the last stop, we were able to do it. Well, congratulations. Richard Childress racing in victory lane for the fourth consecutive time here in Richmond. So there you see Clint as he is getting ready to start the celebration here in Victory Lane as he wins by 1.4 seconds over Matt Kenseth at Richmond International Raceway. We'll talk to him when he gets over to Winter Circle. 
Many crew cabs on the road look like this. You wanted something with a little more meat on its bones. Sweet mercy. Introducing the all-new Tundra Crew Max. Ordinarily towing over 10,000 pounds meant eating your knees for lunch. You want a half ton with the most leg room for you and a meatball sub. Mmm, tasty. Available on the all-new Tundra Crew Max. Hey, rookie, wanna get out in the field? Get this to Alton and get your butt right back here. Listen closely, Mr. Maxwell. I think you got the wrong guy here. You tried to double-cross the wrong people, and now... Transmission interrupted. Hello? Hello? To see what happens next, go to cturookie.com. Powered by Degree Men. More power than you need. One day, you'll need it. Now that the days are longer and the weather's getting warmer, my husband and I were talking about everything we need to do this weekend. He said we should thatch the lawn, clean the barn, fix the fence, and put new belts on the mower. So I said, great. What should we do on Sunday? Time to dig in and get the job done at Tractor Supply. Through May 20th, save 15% on groundwork seed, sprayers, hose, sprinklers, and garden tools. And this 24-horsepower Husqvarna, just $19.99. The stuff you need out here is in here. Tractor Supply.